Hammett City Council to order. Clerk, may I have a roll call, please? Mayor Brown? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Krupa? Here. Councilmember Meyer? Here. Councilmember Percival? Here. Councilmember Wright? Here. Thank you. Okay, and would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Mayor Pro Tem. Obviously, this is a bit of a unique situation and one that I hope that we don't have to repeat too often. But under the circumstances, we felt it necessary to call this emergency meeting and consider a resolution proclaiming the existence of an emergency situation and local emergency due to the worldwide spread of the COVID-19 uh, virus. And at the conclusion of our, of our uh, discussion and a presentation by our city manager, uh, we will adjourn into a closed session. So, city manager? Uh, so, just a point of clarification. I know Eric's on the line, but one of the items that the mayor just mentioned was that we would like to, after this uh, public portion of the meeting is conducted, uh, go into closed session. So is there anything that we have to do logistically to make that happen, Eric? that we add the closed session item to the agenda per the government code that was just stipulated by our city attorney. Second. I have um, comments before we go and vote on this. Why does it need to be closed session? It's not like it's a secret what we're doing, right? I think there are particulars with respect to some of the uh, items that came about with Governor Newsom's order as well as um, items that have come about since then, that we'll need to. The public uh, all heard the same. That we'll need to discuss in closed session. Did. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second to add a closed session to the agenda. Please do a roll call vote. Councilor Meyer? No. Councilor Crystal? Yes. Hi, uh, Councilor Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Krupa? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. Uh, the other item, Eric, if you could chime in as well. Um, I know it's an emergency meeting. We do have at least one member of the public here. Um, requirements to have uh, the opportunity for the public to comment on this agenda. I know it wasn't listed here, but is it something that needs to uh, be added as well? Thank you, Eric. 
All right, so thank you, Mayor. Uh, with that being said, the item before you is a resolution uh, authorizing or proclaiming the existence of an emergency situation and local emergency due to worldwide spread of COVID-19. Uh, the second item is to uh, discuss other emergency actions the Council may decide to consider uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 54954.2. Um, as it's been uh, seen around the world and particularly in the state of California and the United States, uh, COVID-19 continues to pose a significant threat to our community and the larger community surrounding uh, our area. Uh, based on uh, a collaborative discussion that we've been uh, having throughout the last few weeks, including our emergency services personnel, as well as uh, our emergency services coordinator, as well as legal uh, we felt that based on the circumstances and based on the number of closures that are happening uh, throughout the state, that it was imperative that the city uh, council uh, weigh in on this resolution and really provide the opportunity for uh, me as the emergency services uh, manager for the community to implement whatever is needed to address some of the concerns that exist here specifically in our community. I know in, in our community in particular, we have a number of uh, senior citizens. We have uh, a number of individuals that do have health concerns that uh, in terms of the risk that it poses to the average uh, citizen uh, may not be as great as it is for those that have underlying health conditions or those that are uh, elderly. And so that is the reason why we have this item before you. Um, we have both of our, we have our police chief as well as our fire chief as well as our emergency services coordinator that is that are here today uh, to provide any commentary. I know that uh, public safety is a top concern for uh, for me as, as well as the community. And so there's a number of items that we have done in terms of uh, our boots on the ground to ensure that they stay safe throughout our community and both of them are here to answer any questions uh, should you have any. Uh, I, I should also urge that um, I sent an email earlier to the city uh, employee team this morning that uh, this, you know, it seems alarming, it seems very uh, drastic, but if you look at the, the, the bones of the resolution, um, authorizes the city council to look at uh, teleconferencing and encouraging social distances between individuals. So we will be looking at um, items such as teleconferencing. I know we've utilized that here too. Uh, did we state for the record we checked the teleconferencing for today? Yes, it's it's up right now. Okay, but I mean, for the record, so everybody that's watching knows that we did check it for people? Yes. In it's, public comment? Yeah, well, okay. I think when the resolution comes up, that's when the public comment will be there. But uh, we'll be, they'll... I mean, it's it's announced on this meeting. They can either be here or tell, call in. Correct. Okay. So the time for them to speak is when the resolution is before the council. So just as it is for the rest of the community here. Um, so we are doing a few different things operationally in terms of uh, making sure that the public has access to our meetings, but still maintaining uh, social uh, distances that is provided by the CDC. Uh, so as a, an immediate item, what we did was we created the uh, teleconference number so that individuals could call in, provide comments as appropriate, and that is uh, included on the city's agenda. Um, so with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions that the council might have as well as any, councils, any questions the council might have for uh, our police or fire chief. Any questions or comments from council? I have a comment. Um, I hope that our meeting today does not make or cause more panic in our community because the community reaction that across America is out of control. And so people need to think of their neighbors and they need to um, just plan for a week like they normally would grocery wise because when we have elderly people walking out of the grocery store crying because they can't find toilet paper but someone else may have tons of it at home these type of situations are in each citizen's control and so people don't need to be stockpiling and you know our water isn't stopping coming out of the fountains you know there are many things that cause panic and having another meeting today and causing, you know, we need to be clear that this is not what we're trying to, to do here. Well, I totally concur with, with your sentiment on that, and, and it's, it's my hope, actually, that by having this uh, emergency meeting and having our discussion, 
will lend a sense of calm to the community because I, I agree that there's been, a, in my opinion, a significant overreaction, uh, probably stimulated by mainstream media and, and the hype and the perpetual reporting. Obviously, people need to be informed and they need, need to make prudent choices about what they do to protect their own health and the health of their friends and neighbors and family members. But I'm hoping that, that uh, by holding this meeting, we can try to instill a sense of calm and rational behavior by all of our public, not just the Hammock community. And I'd just like to add on to that, that some of the things that have come out on social media over the last few days, uh, and Carly, you hit the nail on the head with that one, um, that encouraging our grocery stores and such to possibly limit the number of uh, items that people come in and purchase to discourage hoarding of, of certain items. But also on that note, there's been a lot of comments, especially on next door to the area that I belong to because it includes several senior communities and the outreach to their neighbors and offering to run errands or to take them to, you know, get food for them or whatever. Uh, it's, it's amazing what the outpouring is and it, it shows the extremely good, generous, caring side of, oh, crimely. <laughs> my, both my phones are ringing at the same time. Uh, it, it shows what a good community we have. And I, I think that is one of the things we need to, to remember and to rely on, that we are a community of caring people, and, uh, you know, we're there to help. And I, I would agree with that. I'm over 65. I am healthy. Took the temperature this morning, 98.1. Uh, and, it, you know, I'm available also for, to run errands, to, to get groceries, uh, so, yeah, I, I think we're all here to help, and we need to get that word out that it, this is not, uh, uh, and again, what is it? Uh, not the end of the earth. And then Armageddon, that one. Yeah. Uh, it, but that we do need to be cautious. We do need to be careful. Uh, but, again, uh, we're going to get through this. So that's – thank you. I think that um, all the comments that I've heard this morning are – are right on it. It's my, my concern is the mass hysteria that's been created uh, via social media and through the media. Um, I am by no means a healthcare professional. Um, I think that if somebody has a concern, if they might be infected or if they're concerned about getting infected, I think this is a conversation that that individual needs to have with their doctor um, and not listening to all the hysteria that's on social media and on the media. Um, it, it's something that this is a conversation for an individual to have with their physician. And um, that's where that concern lies. As far as the government's role, I think that from what I've heard from the president and from the governor is that they're starting to become a little bit of an overreach. Um, that's my personal opinion. And I think that by us, um, the action that we take to close any um, public facility, government-owned facility, I think is appropriate, but I think that when government now takes, the, takes on the role that they're going to take over hotels and giving orders to private business to close, um, I think that's completely inappropriate. Um, it's Again, it goes back to the individual to use some sense in keeping themselves safe and again, consult with their physician and not fall into the hype and hysteria that's being created out there. Um, it has detrimental harm to our community. Um, I think that, you know, the, the big question is, is that when the government now orders businesses to close, um, who's going to pay their bills? Because there's no relief for mom and pop businesses that are out there that are trying to put kids through college or pay their bills day to day when government comes in and says shut down your business okay well they excuse me they still have bills to pay and that's my concern with all the hysteria that's going on around um, again I mean it's my position is if you are concerned consult with your physician 
Well, I certainly agree with uh, a lot that our, my colleagues have um, conveyed, but again, um, we also need to, to look at our senior de demographic, and I certainly would like to see the grocery stores open two hours ahead um, for seniors uh, to go in and, and not be in a panic and not have to stand in long lines. I think that would be appropriate. Um, again, most of the um, suggestions that have been made by the governor are simply that, suggestions, a lot of it, and um, uh, not quite directives, total directive to some point. Um, and to Mike's point, uh, it's up to all of us to individually um, determine what is best for us on a number of levels. So, and, and again, um, to speak on what Mayor Pro Tem indicated with regards to helping our neighbors, that's, num that's another number one priority um, for those of us. Now, you know, there's some of us that are over 65. <laughs> <laughs> I think the majority of here is over 65. Um, <laughs> but um, in any event, but I wouldn't be taking advantage of um, this grocery store is opening early. I'd leave that for those that are desperately in need of that. But in any event, um, again, as a community, we've always stepped up to the plate when when the community was in need, and um, we should expect that to continue. And thank you for your your comments and input. I, I totally agree, and and uh, I'd like to just underscore the the uh, point that I think. Michael started with it, it's personal accountability. And that's something that I think has been dying off in society is personal accountability. Everything seems to be somebody else's fault and I'm not responsible for anything or any of the consequences and, and it's exactly the opposite. What we do with our lives, whether it's dealing with our personal hygiene and health or our conduct out in uh, in society, it's on us, and it's up to each individual to behave responsibly, and that has to do with with uh, if they feel sick, consulting with their uh, physician, and personal responsibility when you're shopping, you go buy what you need, and and you be respectful of other people and and. Uh, We'll, we'll get through this just fine. One more thing. The other important thing is the self-quarantining. Anybody with the symptoms need to have enough self-control to, to stay home. Because too many times, whether it's people that have traveled or people that have the cough and fever, shortness of breath, and they don't call their physician and they go here and go there, and it's horrible. And nobody wants to have to stay home. But thinking of others, they should heed that warning. That would help a lot. The other thing I want to add is that although the city of Hemet doesn't have any confirmed cases, uh, we see this as a proactive measure that the city could take to try and uh, deal with it on the front side and prevent uh, potential future exposures for the city of Hemet. So that's why uh, we see this as being very proactive. What are the things that the city of Hemet can do to help limit uh, other individuals from uh, dealing with this and so it's really a proactive measure that the city of Hemet is taking to deal with this uh, and move forward in the community as well. Okay, with that, we, we do have uh, a resolution before us. And uh, there was one small typo on page four. I've communicated that to our city clerk, and he'll have a, a revised version. It was just one word missing on page 4, line 18, uh, where it refers to the President of the United, the word states is, is going to be added into that. So we do have the resolution before us, resolution number 2020-018, which is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Hemet proclaiming the existence of an emergency situation and local emergency due to the worldwide spread of COVID-19. So may I have a motion on this resolution? So we do, we do have members on the line, and then we do have at least one member of the public that's here at the 
the council can do that. And, and I want to talk about some wording in here, too. Okay. Do we have any members of the public in our physical audience here that wants to comment on this resolution? Okay. Seeing none, I'll refer to our city clerk. Do you have any comments uh, forthcoming from telecommuting? Are there any members of the public that are uh, by teleconference to have a public comment on this item? Well, since I'm on it, I will comment. And, and uh, um, your name is, ma'am? Kitty Rice. Oh. Having gone through teleconferencing things before, if you want to do this in the future, I would suggest something like Zoom or Maestro so that you can have documents visible to people and you can ha you can garner comments in the chat room and it might be actually a physically better way to go but the resolution itself is fine I just don't think I, I expected a little more um, and never mind the resolution is all you're doing now thank you for your comment are there any other comments? Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Marley. Myers Marley. <laughs> Myers, that's, right. that's a hybrid name. <laughs> Councilmember Meyer, do you have fine. comments? Um, yes. On, on page four, on the bottom of page four, we have um, the superintendent, and, and I don't think that the, the information is incorrect, but I do think it is important to know that they're not resuming school until April 13th. That is Easter vacation is actually incorporated into part of this quarantine time. So we have children out of school for four weeks. That's awesome with nothing to do. Hopefully we don't see, hopefully our new chief of police doesn't have extra activities. Um, but I think that that in itself hopefully doesn't create a problem. Um, and actually, the um, it says that the school district has suspended regular classes and school activities until April 3rd, when actually many activities have been canceled all the way through June already. So some of that may need to be noted because of the extreme measures that have been taken. If we're if we're noting facts, um, the other the other uh, point I wanted to point out was on page five, line nineteen, and we have the word severely. And again, we're trying not to create panic here, since there are fourteen cases in Riverside County, fourteen confirmed cases severely, and so just need to be. I don't know, I just think that we need to be balanced, and I don't know that severely is a balanced word. On the top of page six, we have the shall be reviewed at least every 60 days, and just so that we talk about it, we don't have to wait 60 days since Riverside, Riverside County Health Department has their, you know, restrictions through April 30th. Yeah, one of the things that we talked about with legal on Friday was that um, if there's additional items that come up within um, – let's say next week, then we'll need to address them at that point. But I think by law, uh, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that's the requirement that the city council just reauthorizes it at least once every 60 days. Okay, and then um, also on page six, section three. Thank you. 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 Um, obviously, if there's no need for an emergency after a certain period of time, you can cancel the emergency declaration. The law only requires you to review it once every 60 days, but it doesn't prohibit you from reviewing that as often as you would like. Yeah, that's a good idea. If I could comment, if this could, since this is such, such a fluid situation, if we can just have this as ongoing for the time being. I think, I think that would be prudent. Um, the, the last thing is, uh, well, not the last thing, but on section three on page six, and we have um, 
the teleconferencing. Now, this is optional. Is that correct? It's not a mandate that they are not people are not allowed to come to meetings. So I think, uh, in terms of the uh, social distancing mm -hmm, for public. So what we're trying to encourage is kind of leading by example. So encouraging um, the so social distancing. So that's why we've included that on there. But I don't know. Uh, that I know it's I'm a asking. We are encouraging it, but it's not a mandate. I don't know that it's a mandate. Okay, that's what I just wanted to clarify. And then back to. Page four, under the suspended certain provisions of the Brown Act. I just, I feel like maybe the attorney can comment on this or the city manager that we're not trying to do anything, you know, on the Brown Act as far as anything sneaky or we're just trying to provide additional options that are not always available. Do you want to clarify with that, city attorney? That is correct. The governor's executive order does not suspend the Brown Act. All it does is suspend certain technical rules with regard to using teleconferencing at council or commission meetings. And the intent of the governor's executive order was to make it easier for city councils to not only allow council members and staff to tele teleconference in meetings, but also members of the public to teleconference or participate in the meeting by other electronic means, similar to what one of your public speakers said earlier. It's not an intent to avoid the Brown Act, and the governor's executive order does say that to the extent possible, we should continue to comply with the Brown Act to the extent possible. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, a suggestion. Uh, Carly, one of your comments was on section one on page five, use of the word severely. Uh, would the council be more comfortable with a phrase that um, instead of saying that severely impairs, that may potentially severely impair? Because as, as we pointed out, there are no reported cases in our jurisdiction. Uh, and there's only a small number of cases reported in Riverside County, two of which were people that got off of a cruise ship, and the other ten are in Coachella Valley. doesn't mean that it couldn't spread to our area, but we don't have any reported cases currently. So I would suggest that to address your concern on that, Carly, is that we uh, modify that sentence to say that may potentially severely impair. How about just potentially impairs? I, I don't I'd be okay it. with that, too. I just think that, the, you know, the extremity has got to, we just got to, whoo, bring it down. Any uh, opinion on that, City Attorney? Uh, I mean, we're talking about semantics. I'm sorry, I was talking over you. He didn't hear the question. The section one, the question. section one on page five that reads, the above recitals are true and correct and based thereon, hereby finds that the spread and potential further spread of COVID-19 constitutes a situation that severely impairs the public health. It's the word severely that we're discussing and we're suggesting that in an effort to encourage calm and responsive behavior, uh, responsible behavior that severely be replaced that with the word potentially. Yeah, that uh, unfortunately, I, I'm 
appreciate the council sentiments. That's the language that's in the Brown Act. And so if the council does not feel that you have a severe situation, then you don't have an emergency and you should not adopt the declaration. Um, otherwise, we won't meet the definition of a, an emergency in the Brown Act and you won't meet the definition under the California Emergency Assistance Act. Okay. Well, thank you for that clarification. That, that does raise uh, another question and, and uh, probably for the uh, city attorney or maybe for our uh, chiefs or our emergency services coordinator. It's, it's also my understanding that one of the purposes of, of a local declaration that it basically sets a point in time, starts the clock, if you will, as far as our ability to be eligible for reimbursement of any associated uh, financial impact. Is that, a, is that a, an accurate statement? Um, that certainly isn't a reason in and of itself to pass an emergency declaration. The council needs to be comfortable that the facts and circumstances do constitute an emergency as defined in those two things in the law. Um, I'm not a health official, nor am I an emergency official, so if you are concerned about that, you should inquire of your police and your fire chiefs my understanding based on my work with other communities and the reading I've done based on the CDC and county declaration is that there is at least an emergency situation in California and in the state of Riverside and your accompanying uh, counties, or the county of Riverside and your accompanying county of San Bernardino, uh, and that other jurisdictions within the city or within the county of Riverside believe that there's an emergency declaration or an emergency situation. It does not necessarily mean that there's an emergency in Hemet. So if you do not think that the facts that the, we've recited resolution constitute an emergency within the city of Hemet itself, then you should call upon the police chief and the fire chief to provide you with additional information. Okay. Thank you very much. And we have uh, both police and fire chiefs here as well as our emergency services coordinator so would, looks like Chief Brown wants to comment. Mayor, members of the council. Mayor, members of the council, Mr. City Manager, just to add clarification uh, to the question um, at hand, uh, the provisions of the Stafford Act which are included in this declaration allow us access to federal funding so basically it's a portal for if we have any cost incurred or that we have yet to identify as part of supporting this, no matter how long it goes, it's part of the, the, the bureaucratic process, if you will, that allows us access to that federal funding offset. Uh, those costs have yet to be tabulated. We don't, there's going to be direct and indirect costs. We don't know what that is. And I think we're following the lead and direction of the county. Uh, as well as the state authorities and making sure that we're part of that, uh, that process for that reason to ensure that if we do incur any associated cost with that, that could be personnel, that could be equipment, uh, impact, impacts, et cetera, uh, that allows us that access to those uh, dollars. So, Chief, um, as far as it maybe go over with us, and I'm sure that this would include, include all of our departments, but as you could see, um, what would be financial impact? I mean, we have first responders, we have, you know, f people that are hands-on responding to unknown situations that we need to protect. So what would be costs? Well, the direct, there's direct cost, and we're doing that assessment now. So, for instance, personal protective equipment for both the police and our firefighters and, and our uh, first responder partners. Uh, the cost of where we've activated our EOC, so we have personnel costs that we've yet to, uh, to, to tabulate. But let's say, for instance, we decide we make a, a joint decision to stand up the EOC. There's going to be costs directly associated with that. We're currently at a management level, which is the lowest level uh, possible. We plan on conferencing with uh, our city manager later today and reassess that. I think the key to all this is it's fluid, so there's, we, we just don't know. 
And um, again, I would I would echo the council. I think I've talked to a couple of you and share the same uh, same uh, concerns that you've expressed. But the business side, we need to be prepared, and that's everything that you're hearing and being uh, brought to you today is in, in preparatory for for what we may have to deal with. Cost of additional personnel. There is um, if we have an exposure, there's cost to the city in terms of. Uh, our force protection, if they get need to have be quarantined, there's extremely uh, a lot of dollars associated with that. Uh, San Jose Fire Department had an exposure. Uh, they have 77 of their personnel now on quarantine for uh, tested positive. So in very quick order, those types of impacts, we've been very fortunate and we haven't uh, had to deal with that. Now what we are dealing with is the planning and making sure that, and that's what's before you today, we are directly involved with county health. We participate on conference calls twice a day with public health in the county. I also, as of uh, Friday, am the duty officer for the next three weeks for the county, so we're getting plugged in operationally, public health. And over the weekend, we, we uh, uh, conference with Dr. Hanna in our medical direction, and, and currently Dr. Hanna's uh, available to us 24-7 to address our local need, uh, understanding that we want to make sure that we get facts and we want to make sure that we're in, 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 in the position to give you correct information, not Facebook information, but what are the facts real time. But uh, the declaration really, getting back to the original point, deals with uh, a formal process that allows us access to, to federal funding if that uh, or other dollars should that need come up. And we're just being proactive with that. And I think the city manager has a comment on that. Yeah, I, first off, I want to thank uh, both chiefs, um, as well as Kat, for their uh, being plugged in with the county, with all of the resources above our level. They've done an incredible job to keep uh, me in the loop and uh, just be apprised of what's going on. I think Chief Brown uh, really hit on something that is really significant. If we were to encounter a situation, and I'm not saying that it's as a result of one of our community members, but everyone has family members, they all have friends, they all have other people that they associate with. So if any of those individuals that may or may not reside in the city of Hemet potentially are in contact with someone that has that, then that puts those individuals at risk. And so there's, you know, there's the direct impact that is as a result of dealing with our community, but there's this also other interconnectedness that happens within uh, just living and, and being a human. And so that's really uh, what the chief alluded to, the instances where um, if an individual on the public safety side or even on the employee side interacts with someone that has that, then it creates significant operational issues for us. And so that is part of why this is before you is that, uh, you know, there are some things that we're considering or that we have to be concerned about given that, you know, we just all don't congregate or interface with people that are just in our community. We interface with other people outside of the community as well. Great. I like the fact that we are being proactive and not waiting for a problem, but since it's in our back door, it's at our back door, then we'll, we'll have a plan. The, all right. the other thing I want to add to, if the members on the conference line if you aren't the city attorney, could you please mute your phone? We're getting a lot of background and comments from members of the public on that phone. So if you could just mute that, no, we'd appreciate it. Okay, well, that, uh, that addresses uh, my question, so thank you. Uh, Chief Poos, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Good morning, uh, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, we've had open lines of communication this weekend. Uh, Fire Chief hit the key points. This is quickly evolving. So new information daily, we are receiving that. And we don't know what to expect, obviously. So that's where we're at right now. We're, we'll continue these conversations with uh, county and state officials just to make sure that we're on top of everything. Thank you. And I do appreciate the press release that your department put out explaining to the public that they may see a little bit different manifestation of, of uh, how the uh, PD responds. So that's good information. Again, on the proactive side, letting people know what to expect is real important. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any more uh, comments or discussion?
from counsel on this? Besides our emergency services department, obviously any costs that are incurred by other public services that we have, right? Because we have our public works department, we have the library, we have even city hall. And so I'm sure that you're going to go through and figure out some, you know, healthy people only in the lobby, please, or something, you know, just to remind people about that. But then also having masks available if necessary, because there will be that one guy who comes through coughing. That's actually a really great point. And one of the items of conversation that we're having right now with our E-team is making sure that members of the public are aware and know of the options that they have, whether it's to pay their bills online, through the website, so that they're not having to deal with our staff on a one-to-one basis. And so we're encouraging the use, or we will encourage the use and the expanded use of those operations so that they can not have to drive. I know we mentioned the senior citizens, so that they're able to take care of their business, but then also not put themselves at risk by getting in their car and driving around and all that. So we'll be encouraging the use of all those mechanisms, too. And some sort of mechanism that if someone walks into City Hall coughing, they need to be masked immediately, even before they're told to leave, just as a protection. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, then I'll entertain a motion on the proposed resolution with the corrections noted. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Meyer? Yes. Councilmember Percival? Yes. Councilmember Wright? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Krupa? Yes. Mayor Brown? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, and thank you for attending, and we will now adjourn into closed session. Thank you.